Thanks to the organizers. Uh, been a great workshop so far. Um, so yeah, this what I'm going to talk about today is <clears throat> joint work with uh, Grant Lakeland. He's um, another former student of Alan Reed's. Um, I like to say part of Team Penzoil. So, so what I want to talk about today, um, so let me start with, uh, let's take, for the rest of the talk, just so I don't have to keep writing PSL2C, because that's a lot more letters, let's, let's let G be PSL2C, and gamma uh, in G, a co-compact lattice. Ooh, it's dusty chalk. So, um, what does this mean? This means uh, gamma is a discrete subgroup of uh, G, which means it acts properly discontinuously on H3. So, we identify this with the isometry group, orientation preserving isometry group of H3, and then uh, the quotient M gamma. So, we take hyperbolic three space and quotient by gamma. This is a closed hyperbolic. manifold. And um, so the, one of the uh, very interesting things that happens in dimension three and higher is that uh, you have mass star rigidity. So mass star rigidity says that this hyperbolic three manifold is rigid. So what does that mean? That means any other hyperbolic structure on, uh, on M gamma differs <coughs> from the given one by a homeomorphism. No. So <clears throat> what do I mean? So a hyperbolic structure, so that's a you like GX structure, that's a GH3 structure. And then the group of homeomorphisms of M acts on the set of GH structures, GX structures, by um, just taking your atlas of charts that defines the structure and Precomposing with that. And what we're saying is that any other hyperbolic structure that you put on M gamma um, differs by such a deformation. In fact, the result of goodbye says that, uh, in fact, this homeomorphism is isotopic to the identity. Okay? So, <clears throat> All right, so uh, maybe that seems like the end of the story for sort of deformations. Um, but <clears throat> there's another interesting quotient that you can take. So another. Oh. So another quotient you can take is <clears throat> um, G mod gamma. So I can take the quotient of PSL2C, gamma is sitting inside of there, it acts on the left, and I can take the quotient uh, of G mod gamma. And uh, in 95, uh, G, or maybe before that, I think, G showed that uh, uh, this is not rigid. So I need to explain what, what I mean by that, um, and then uh, that's going to be the in some sense, the, the focus of this talk is uh, the, the kinds of structures that I want to describe now. So <clears throat> observe that G cross G acts on G. So <clears throat> um, if I take two elements, A and B, in G, and then I want to act on some other element, well, I can act on the left by A, 
and on the right by the inverse. And this defines a left action of g cross g on, uh, on g. And uh, for subgroups of g cross g acting properly discontinuously, Uh, Cocom Act. Uh, properly discontinuously, um, we can take a quotient get a nice uh, house door space. I should say, if we're acting freely, we get a G cross G, G structure. So I'll say more about this kind of structure later and why it's interesting. Um, but let me just, if you haven't thought about this before, um, make a remark. <clears throat> so one nice thing about this situation is that if I have a discrete subgroup of G, it acts properly discontinuously on H, or on H3. However, um, note there's a stabilizer uh, in G cross G of the identity. Uh, well, that's the diagonal subgroup. And... Um, uh, this is isomorphic to, uh, to G, which is non-compact. So the stabilizer of the identity is non-compact. So discreteness is not enough to guarantee proper discontinuity of the action. So um, maybe just look at some examples. So let's say, so maybe from now on, let's, let's let J denote the inclusion of, of gamma into G. So what are the kinds of um, subgroups I want to look at? So I'm going to look at subgroups. So we have J, uh, and then we have some other representation, rho, from gamma, uh, uh, not necessarily injective, any representation. And then we can look at J cross rho of gamma. This is a subgroup of G cross G. So it acts on G. And we can ask, when is this J cross rho of gamma acting properly discontinuously. So maybe just a couple examples. Said. So <clears throat> let's say, um, suppose rho, this other representation, is just j. Well, in this case, now I have j cross j of gamma. So I've just put this into the diagonal subgroup. Um, and this fixes uh, the identity. So definitely not properly discontinuous. On the other hand, if I take the trivial representation, so rho, let's say rho naught, uh, rho naught of any gamma is the identity, well, then when I look at j cross rho naught of gamma, this is just gamma cross the identity. And in this case, uh, Put it over here. In this case, uh, J cross rho naught of gamma. So this does act properly discontinuously. This is just the original quotient by the action on the left that we saw at the beginning. OK? Make sense? <clears throat> so what's the, this? Um, non-rigidity that I'm referring to here. <clears throat> so it's a theorem. Jeez. That, <clears throat> let's see, for all rows sufficiently close, not J cross rho of gamma acting on G uh, is properly discontinuous.
And in particular, um, if you have non-trivial deformations of the trivial representation, then you get, um, you get sort of new, say new G cross G, G structures. So the quotients turn out again to be uh, diffeomorphic to uh, G mod gamma. So these are new structures on G mod gamma. OK? So <clears throat> let me just say a little bit. Um, so this is, this is definitely outside of my uh, area of expertise. So, but this seems really cool. Um, let me tell you just a little bit about, uh, if you haven't seen this before, maybe why you would care about these G cross G, G structures. So one, actually, um, so PSL2C is a complex Lie group, and the quotient is a complex three manifold. And actually, G showed something stronger. He showed that um, these deformations, so these deformations, um, Uh, of the theorem are precisely, well, he was working in SL2C, uh, some, anyway, precisely the deformations of the complex structure. So when you deform the complex structure on, uh, on G, a, a sufficiently small deformation of the complex structure actually corresponds to a deformation of this G cross G structure. Um, let me also uh, mention that, <clears throat> so the killing form uh, on G is invariant under both left and right multiplication and defines, uh, let's see, on G defines called a holomorphic Ramanian metric, in fact, of constant negative curvature. So let me just say uh, a little bit about this, because this is not something I'd ever run into before. So um, what's a holomorphic Ramanian metric? Uh, that's just a bilinear, a holomorphically varying, non-degenerate bilinear form uh, on the tangent spaces. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, so this doesn't have anything to do with Hermitian forms, um, it's sort of the direct analog of the real Ramanian metrics, but you can do sort of Levi-Civita Levi connections, curvature. And <clears throat> um, uh, so anyway, this, this is an example of a holomorphic Ramanian metric of constant negative curvature. And uh, so these have been studied uh, 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 quite intensively, um, especially in low dimensions. So uh, Dumitrescu in dimension three show that these are, these are quite a bit more rigid than, um, so holomorphic Ramanian metrics are quite a bit more rigid than their real counterparts. Um, so in dimension three, they're always locally homogeneous. And then uh, Dumitrescu and Zagib proved uh, kind of uniformization theorem. And so these are, these G cross G, uh, comma G structures are one of the sort of models um, that you want to study in, uh, in dimension three. Okay? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know, somebody, I don't know what sort of, not, I mean, I think they're not Kaler. Um, Yeah. I'm sorry? For co-compact lattices in SL2C, uh, that's right. Uh, I'll, I'll say more about, there's, this has been generalized quite a bit, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, um, any other questions on the sort of structure? OK. Uh, OK, good on time. All right, so now, um, uh, 
So you get these properly discontinuous actions. They're, there's something that you have to, to do to actually get that. And so let me um, describe condition for proper discontinuity. Let me state the theorem, and then I'll talk about it a little bit, because it sort of relates to lots of different things. <coughs> so um, the theorem. Gary Tell and Cassell. Which says, um, so we'll look at um, the inclusion of gamma into G. And uh, this is true in much more generality than what I'm going to um, talk about. But for now, let's think about gamma, this co-compact lattice, um, rho from gamma to G, any representation. Then <clears throat> J cross rho gamma acts properly discontinuously on G if and only if there exists uh, a J rho equivariant contraction, a strict contraction. Uh, let's call it F tilde from H3 to H3. So uh, here I've got two actions of gamma on H3, one by J of gamma, just the, the, the given action from the inclusion, and the other one, uh, rho. And so we want a, a J rho equivariant uh, strict contraction. So in the case where rho of gamma is, again, discrete, um, rho is not going to be injective in general, but rho is discrete, then this map, this equivariant map, is the same thing as a, uh, a map on the quotients. So from m gamma, the quotient of H3 by gamma, to the quotient of H3 by rho gamma. Um, and uh, so let me, uh, this has a name. This is uh, sometimes say that rho is strictly dominated by, by j. <clears throat> okay, so let me uh, pause for a few minutes and, and just say something about this, uh, this theorem. So, uh, so this, was, this was proved first in the case actually where G was um, PSL2R. Uh, and in that case, uh, that was due to um, Kessel. Uh, the reason that's particularly interesting um, doesn't have anything to do with, with this, but rather in that case, um, as PSL2R cross PSL2R, um, comma PSL2R structures, uh, those are exactly ADS3 structures. And so uh, <clears throat> uh, a lot of people have thought about discrete, uh, properly discontinuous actions in that case. Um, going back, let me just uh, say some people, Goldman, Kolkarni, Kolkarni Raymond. I think the, the first um, way of thinking about this kind of condition um, due to Salah, right, Salah. Um, but uh, a lot of other people thought about this, Cassell, Gary Toe Cassell, Gary Toe Cassell Wolf, Danziger, Gary Toe Cassell, Dolazon, Darwan Dolazon. So a lot of sort of PSL2R um, results about these sort of actions. Um, as I said, this is true in more generality, so this theorem they proved was actually for G being um, uh, the orientation-preserving isometry group of hyperbolic n space. And um, gamma just needs to be geometrically finite. Um, so uh, and now it's been generalized further by Guichard, uh, Garito, Cassell, and um, Leinhard. Uh, this condition about the strict contraction might look familiar. So Jeff talked about something very similar. He was talking about um, actions on the Lie algebra. Uh, and there, he had these vector fields that were contracting. So that's sort of the infinitesimal version um, of this strict contraction condition. Um, and there's another version of this theorem where one thinks about lengths of, uh, of hyperbolic elements. And you require that the length of, so you could equivalently just require that the length of every hyperbolic element in, um, in rho is uh, strictly, so strictly contracted compared to the length in gamma. Um, and that, 
that version is related to the infinitesimal version um, uh, of this condition um, on lengths due to Goldman, Lavery, and Margulis. So Jeff, I think, mentioned that also briefly. OK, so um, there's a lot sort of uh, going on here. I'm just picking out one particular aspect of it that's relevant for what I want to talk about. So um, OK, well, if you haven't thought of this before, seeing why this is true, um, uh, let me just sort of, the only part that I'm actually going to worry about is um, if you have this strict domination, why do you get proper discontinuity? So let me explain that picture. And it, again, this should look familiar because this is similar to what Jeff was talking about. So <clears throat> so one way to think about why um, discreteness, so if you act properly discontinuously on H3, then just the usual left action of uh, the group on G is properly discontinuous because you have an equivariant um, proper map from G to H3. And um, so it turns out that you also have that when you have a strict contraction. So let's suppose, let's suppose F tilde from H3 to H3 is um, strict, so this is J rho equivariant strict contraction. And um, so there's a really cool construction here just building a, um, a proper map from, proper equivariant map from G to H3. So build, so define map from G to H3. <clears throat> so how am I going to use the map F tilde to find the map from G to H3? Well, let's just take uh, a group element and let's send it to the unique fixed point of G composed with F tilde. So F tilde is a strict contraction, so it has a unique fixed point in H3. And if I compose with an isometry, that's again a strict contraction. Uh, so it's not too hard. You can check that this map, uh, this is uh, equivariant. So on G, we have the action of J cross rho of gamma. And over here, we're just looking at the action of gamma. So this uh, is equivariant with respect to that action. And uh, the fibers of this map are all copies of SO3. So uh, again, if you're used to thinking about the, the case of G uh, of a group acting just uh, on the left, so the trivial representation on the right, the strict contraction is just a constant map. And that's you pick a base point, right? And you look at the orbit of the base point. That's exactly what this map is in that case. So, um, all right, so now we have a proper map from G to H3. So we're acting properly discontinuously here, which means we act properly discontinuously on, on G. Does that make sense? OK. Um, So, uh, so in this case, uh, the equivariance, so this is really a, uh, a fibration of G over H3, an equivariant fibration of H, uh, G over H3. And so we get out of this um, an SO3 bundle. Sorry? Um, this is actually a fibration with fibers that are this compact SO3. Yeah, so yeah, it's a, yeah, I should say it's actually a vibration. So, um, so we get some SO3 bundle, uh, G mod J cross rho gamma to M gamma. And in uh, Jesus' theorem, that's what we're seeing. Now we're seeing different um, G cross G structures on the, the given um, SO3 bundle. So um, let me uh, give this set of representations a name. So um, 
Mm. Let's write Dom Gamma G. So these are the representations. Rho is strictly dominated by the inclusion. So equivalently, these are the representations that exactly give you proper, discont uh, proper discontinuity for the action. OK, so <clears throat> um, the action of G cross G on G also preserves a volume form. And so you could um, look at the volumes of the quotients. So there's some normalization involved. I'm going to say anything about so. Tholazon gave a, um, a formula for the volumes of these quotients. Again, in general, for quotients um, of SON1 by uh, groups acting properly dis dis discontinuously in SON1 cross SON1. But let me just again stick to this case. Um, <clears throat> so suppose J. As uh, the inclusion, row, some representation, so that I get a properly discontinuous action. And then uh, the volume of this quotient, let me just write it j cross rho. So that's the volume of so these are acting properly discontinuously. I can take the quotient. The volume of this quotient is given by. So I'm normalization constant. Um, so this is the volume of SO3, again, with respect to certain um, normalizations. And then you just see the two volumes. Um, so you have the volume of the original, say, compact hyperbolic manifold minus the volume of the representation row. So what is this, uh, this volume here? Let me just say. So we've got this, because we're strictly dominated, we've got this equivariant Lipschitz map from H3 to H3. We can pull back the volume form, so we can take F tilde star of the volume form on H3. And then we can integrate that. We push it down to the quotient. The map is equivariant. Um, that volume form is invariant. We can push it down to the quotient um, and compute the volume. OK? So um, I want to make some comments about this. Uh, oh, there's one more bit that's useful for us. Uh, <clears throat> so moreover, this function from uh, these representations to um, are given by sending rho to the volume of this quotient is rigid, uh, is locally finite. So uh, let's see a few words about this. Uh, so this is this theorem is also true, again, not just for G uh, PSL2C, but actually for uh, SON1 uh, for all n greater than or equal to 3. And, and uh, uh, oh, and, and um, gamma can be a compact or non-compact lattice, co-compact, non-co-compact lattice. Um, uh, and in dimension two, yeah. Oh, sorry, locally constant. Sorry, that's thanks. Sorry, locally constant. Uh, yeah, it's also locally finite. <laughs> locally one. Um, thanks. Um, so, uh, right, so whether gamma is compact or non-compact, uh, this is true in dimension three and higher. Um, in dimension two, it's also true for compact, um, but it's false for non-compact. Um, and so, uh, so this rigidity, um, this sort of volume rigidity, um, mostly follows from uh, the Besson-Courtois-Gallot uh, volume rigidity because of, because of this formula. 
Uh, the non-compact dimension three case requires a little more work because the um, because there you, you don't have that volume rigidity. Um, but uh, it turns out that whenever you have one of these dominator representations, they always have to send parabolics to elliptic elements. And in that case, the volumes are, um, are, uh, uh, are locally constant. So, um, so let me just also say that in the non-compact case, uh, you have to be a bit more careful with this. Um, there are various things you might try to do, and the volume that you get uh, turns out to be uh, the same as the, all the usual volumes, so uh, Frank Avia, um, Kim and Kim, Bucher, 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 Berger, and Yotza, um, all versions of this volume, and this agrees with that in, uh, in those settings. So, um, so they said that the two-dimensional cases, um, so when G is PSL2R, it's not what I'm thinking about here, but let me just mention, um, and gamma is compact, Ceylon gave uh, um, uh, lots of values for the volume. Um, in fact, sort of, he constructed what turned out to be all the possible volumes that you could get for a co-compact lattice. Um, and uh, using this formula, Tholazon um, ensured that that was all the possible volumes. Uh, and then Tholazon in the non-compact case in dimension two showed that actually not only is this not locally constant, but you get an entire interval um, of volumes. Okay, but again, that's, that's not the situation I'm, I'm talking about. I want to think about dimension three. And there, um, uh, well, if you think about the construction of G's, those were deformations of the trivial representation, which has zero volume. And so, um, so this term for all of those representations is zero. Uh, and the, so then the question that, uh, that Tholazan asked was, actually it was here last fall where I heard this question, um, does, uh, does there exist co-compact uh, gamma G rho one of these dominated representations, such that the volume isn't just um, the volume of, uh, of this guy, such that the volume of rho is non-zero. So, um, so we started looking, and uh, well, we found an example on math overflow. Um, to Ian Eagle. So let me describe that example. Um, math overflow. Isn't it great? So let me just say, um, these are what I'm thinking of as these exotic uh, G quotients. Not just deformations of the um, uh, not just deformations of the trivial representation. Okay, um, <clears throat> so how's this example go? So um, you start with a pair of uh, compact hyperbolic tetrahedra. So here's. So let's say this is two, three, five, two, three, four, and uh, two, three, five, two, three, two. So let's call this T and this T prime. <clears throat> so what do the numbers mean? So there's a hyperbolic, compact hyperbolic tetrahedron whose dihedral angles are pi over two, pi over three, pi over five, and so on. And um, the nice thing is if you, the, the group generated by reflections here is a Coxeter group. So let me write down what the group is. <clears throat> this comes from these numbers. So we have, let's say, uh, we call it gamma bar. This is the group generated by reflections in T. So this is, there are four faces. 
So it has a nice presentation, tau i squared is 1. And then, well, if I do the reflection in one face, let's say this face and this face, uh, that's going to be a rotation of order 2. So the, the edge adjacent to the pair of faces tells me what the, um, the, the order of rotation is. So tau i, tau j um, to the e i j is 1. This is, the, uh, this is the label on the edge adjacent to face i and j. OK? And then there's also one for t prime. Looks very similar. Let me put primes on them, tau 3 prime, tau 4 prime. OK, same sort of thing. And the first thing uh, that you notice is that all the labels here look like the labels here, except this is a 4 and this is a 2, and 2 divides 4. That's nice. So um, there's a homomorphism, rho, from gamma to gamma bar, or sorry, gamma bar to gamma bar prime, that just sends tau i to tau i prime. And you just need to check that all the relations are satisfied. Um, that's pretty easy, right? They're exactly the same, except uh, one of these is a 4 and one of these is a 2. But if the second power is the identity, so is the fourth. OK? All right. Um, I should put some parentheses here. OK, so uh, right. So OK, so we get a homomorphism from gamma bar to gamma bar prime. And now you just need to check a few things. So let me just, let me not do it, but let me just say what you can do. So you check. Uh, what do you need to check? So um, we have our homomorphism. So <clears throat> I need to build this equivariant uh, contraction from H. 3 to h3. And what can I do? Well, um, I'm not going to diss the Klein model. I'm going to use the Klein model so we can, uh, there's a, you can take a linear map. So let's put one of the vertices, let's put this vert vertex at the origin. And this vertex at the origin, actually, if you do that, then this guy actually sits strictly inside of here. And you can find a linear map. So, say, in the Klein model, really projected map, linear map from um, t to t prime. Well, it's a linear map from all of R3 to R3 that sends t to t prime and actually sends, this is, you just need to check this, some computation. You can explicitly calculate where all the vertices of this thing are. Um, it sends uh, hyperbolic three space, the Klein ball, strictly inside of H3. So here's, here's H3 with one of these tetrahedra. And then here's H3 again. And then this goes sort of strictly inside of here to get to the other one. So here's T. Here's T prime. OK, and then you use the Hilbert metric. And you check that the, um, that means that you get a contraction. So um, this means the map from T to T prime is a contraction. And now there's another important property um, this map, which is that um, this is sort of the key point. Uh, <clears throat> so let's call this map um, F naught tilde, sort of the building block for the, the map. Um, if I look at the image of a face, <clears throat> let's say the ith face, this is, uh, this is fixed by rho of tau i. That's tau i prime. OK, if I want to build an equivariant map, what do I do? Well, I, I have my map here. That's f naught tilde. And then I'm going to look at all the tetrahedra that are adjacent to this one. OK, so what, how do I map that guy? Well, first I do a reflection in this face. Then I map over here. And then I do the reflection according to the, um, the image of that reflection. And so in order for that to give me a well-defined map, I need to make sure that the, um, that the thing over here that I'm reflecting also fixes the image of that face. And it does. I mean, that's how the, um, so this homomorphism is defined. OK? So that's sort of the key ingredient. That's sort of the key point here is to get a homomorphism, a map between these two tetrahedra, and then um, uh, ensure this property, and then you just start reflecting and you, 
you extend the map to all of H3. Now, um, OK, so why does this give us a representation with non-trivial uh, volume? So if you look at, um, if you look at the, um, let's, take, let's take the index 2 orientation cover. So gamma bar is not inside of G, right? It's inside the, the um, it has orientation reversing. Um, there's reflections orientation reversing. So let's take the intersection with G. This is the index 2 orientation subgroup. And um, this is the kernel of the determinant homomorphism. The determinant sends each of my reflections to minus 1. And the image also does that. So this, uh, this map actually, uh, rho, uh, I can restrict rho now to gamma. And I get a homomorphism from gamma to gamma prime, which is just the same thing. I intersect. So gamma prime is gamma bar prime intersected with G. That's the index 2 orientation cover there. I get this map this homomorphism now between these two groups, and I can take the quotients. So I look at the map M gamma. So this, um, this map F tilde, oh, I guess I didn't write it down. So from this, we get our map F tilde from uh, H3 to H3. It's rho equivariant. That descends to a map here between these orbifolds. And well, what are the, I mean, what is this thing? This is just the double of this thing over its boundary. And the other guy is the double of that over its boundary. And the map is actually, you know, this is a, if you forget about the fact that there's the singular locus, this is an orientation preserving homeomorphism. So um, this is a degree one map. So the volume of, of this representation is just the, the volume of this guy, which is twice the volume of this. So, um, so the volume of rho restricted to gamma is uh, is uh, uh, twice the volume of T prime. Does that make sense? OK. OK. Um, so. Uh, so what we wanted to do was, well, to see if you could do this um, in any other situation. And uh, it turns out that it's pretty easy to do this um, for lots more examples. So let me show you the setup. Uh, so let's start with, so if Q is a compact all right. Um, polyhedron H3. Um, let's let gamma, uh, we'll say gamma Q bar be the group generated by reflection. So for each face, we have a reflection. And you know, this has a nice presentation. So it says tau F squared is, is the identity. And, tau f, tau uh, f prime. So the two reflections in two faces commute um, if and only if uh, f intersects f prime non-empty. OK? So um, this is a right-angled Coxeter group, um, an example of what Jeff was talking about. So it's interesting that these same groups are showing up here. Um, even though the construction is a bit different. OK, so, well, we can also take the orientation subgroup, call that gamma without the bar, so gamma Q. Again, gamma Q intersected with G. This is our index 2 subgroup of, um, of gamma Q bar. <coughs> so what is the, so what, what do we do? Well, we do something like this. Um, so the theorem, Enzoil twins. Uh, so for any Q and Q prime uh, compact 
right angled hyperbolic polyhedra. Uh, there exists another compact polyhedron. So the group generated by reflections in this one uh, is commensurable with that one. So this is compact right angled polyhedron such that, well, so first the, the group generated by this is a finite index subgroup of, uh, of the original guy. Um, two, uh, these are reflection groups. Uh, actually, sorry, it's the same for the rotation groups. Um, there exists a homomorphism rho from gamma Q1 to gamma Q. And um, uh, if I think about this sitting inside of G, then this representation is strictly dominated by the inclusion of gamma Q1. G. And, well, just like over here, the volume is going to be exactly twice the volume of Q prime. So the volume of this representation, rho, is twice the volume of, uh, of Q prime. Okay? So that's the, um, that's what you can do, sort of more or less following this kind of idea. And it's really um, a, uh, it's the same sort of elementary hyperbolic geometry construction. Anything fancy. Um, so as a corollary, you get lots of volumes. So <clears throat> corolla, coral, 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 Larry. Do I have two L's? Two L's. How about now? <sighs> oh, is this being recorded? Uh, so it's the corollary, say, for any, any uh, right angle compact polyhedron. I just abbreviate that. I'm done writing it. Uh, Q, there exists finite index subgroups um, so we start with gamma Q uh, so let's call that gamma naught so inside of there we have gamma 1 and gamma 2 and gamma 3 and so on um, such that for all n there exists row 1 through row n representations from the nth group uh, into G which are um, strictly dominated by the inclusion, gamma and G. And the volumes are all different. The volume of rho i is different than the volume of rho j. So you get lots of different values for the volume, in fact. Um, okay, so this is a really easy corollary of this construction. You just, so let me just tell you the proof of the corollary quick. Up, uh, proof of, I must be like, must have been on that coffee, killing the chalk. Proof of the corollary. Um, okay, so let's use this construction. I'm going to take two polyhedra. Let me take both of them to be Q. Okay, the theorem says if I have two polyhedra, I can find a finite index subgroup of the rotation group of one of those with a homomorphism to the rotation group of the other one that strictly dominates the inclusion, or strictly dominated by the inclusion. So out of the theorem, we get, um, sort of call it gamma Q1, finite index subgroup of gamma Q, and this row one, call it from gamma Q1 to gamma Q, which is strictly dominated by the inclusion of gamma Q1. So this is in gamma Q1, G. And what's the volume? The volume is just twice the volume of Q. So this is, uh, let me write it like this, it's the volume of um, uh, M gamma, but this should be rho 1 uh, the volume of the original one. So this is, this is the volume of rho 1. 
Yeah, so Q prime is just going to be Q here. Oh, sorry, yeah, let's see. Uh, uh, this is Q, this is uh, Q prime, yeah. Uh, this goes from Q1 into G. Commas look like ones. Um, and this is the volume, yeah. Uh, okay, so. Yeah. They go from gamma n to, well, they're going to go from gamma n to one of these other ones. I'll tell you in a sec. So I've, I've only done sort of the, this is a sort of recursive procedure. So I just did sort of step one. I produced one finite index subgroup, and then you do another one. So now I just repeat. So let's take, so now we take q1 and q1 and apply the theorem. We get, um, uh, we get gamma q2, finite index and gamma q1, and this homomorphism, row, let's call it row two, from gamma Q2 to gamma Q1. And if I think about this inside of G, maybe I should just to remind you, right, this is sitting in G, G. So this is now a representation in, that's dominated by the inclusion of Q2. And the volume is uh, of this row two, well, it's the volume of um, uh, m gamma q1. But I can also compose this row two, row two with the row one. Right? So I do, now I do um, uh, row two, row one. This goes from gamma q2, then to gamma q1, and then all the way down to gamma q. And the volume of that guy, row one, row two, is the volume of the first quotient. Okay? I just keep doing this so, uh, so you repeat. Okay? So this sequence of representations, they're actually just homomorphisms from one group to the previous one in the sequence. Okay, any questions on the corollary? All right, let me... Um, in the last seven minutes, I tell you the, the idea for the proof of the theorem. It's also um, very straightforward. So, okay. So, um, so we start with this Q and Q prime. Let me draw a picture. So here's Q prime, sorry. And now, um, well, Q prime is some compact polyhedron. Let's put that inside of a ball. So there's some ball of some radius in hyperbolic space. And then let's put this inside of a bigger ball. And now, um, so I haven't done anything with Q yet. So uh, we're going to use this trick that goes back to Scott and was used by Egel, Long, and Reed, um, sort of. Uh, a kind of discrete version of taking convex hulls. Um, basically, what I want to do is I want to take Q and I want to tile some convex polyhedron by copies of Q that um, contains this big ball. Okay? And really, the right way to do it is to, the, the tessellation of, of H3 by translates of Q gives you a bunch of hyperbolic planes. So the planes parallel to, that contain all the copies of the faces. Um, and then I can take this ball, and I can look at the half spaces whose boundaries are, you know, not arbitrary planes, but those planes contained in there. And what, okay, so long story short, what you get is something like this. So this is some gigantic polyhedron. So this is, this is our Q1, and, and it's a union, the convex, sorry, I'm writing up here, no one can see, convex union of gamma Q bar translates uh, of Q, okay? So in particular, the, the group generated by reflections in Q1 is commensurable. It's a finite index subgroup of the group generated by reflections in Q, and the orientation subgroup sit inside too. Um, okay, so, sorry? Q, I don't know, Q is maybe like, um, here's Q. Uh, I don't know what it looks like, but I'm just going to start reflecting this if you want and, and keep sort of tiling this out until I've eaten up this whole big ball. Think about it that way. Um, 
So, all right. Um, so now we need to construct this map. So we're going to construct a map from this big polyhedron down to um, the little one. And it's going to be built in some steps. So let me do, uh, let me see if I can figure out the right distance. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do nearest point projection. Okay? So I'm going to do nearest point projection um, to this big ball. And now these, I've got two concentric balls, so I can take spherical coordinates on this ball, and I can just do a radial dilation. Um, and uh, if this was a ball of radius r and this was a ball of radius r prime, that dilation will actually be a, a contraction with ratio r over r prime. And the, so, I mean, that's an explicit sort of easy calculation. So I'm going to do some radial dilation. Call this dilation. And then I'm going to do another closest point projection. Okay. Now, so what happens to um, so what happens to this to this polyhedron? Well, the first thing that uh, you want to show actually is the, the diameter of these faces. Even though I'm taking um, even though I'm taking this ball to be really, really, really big, the diameter of these faces are actually uniformly bounded, independent of how big this ball is. So not so hard to see. Um, and uh, so um, when I do this closest point projection, this, um, these faces get mapped down. So because this sphere here is, is C1 and strictly convex, this and you know, everything sitting inside, the convexity of this, tells me that actually the map from this boundary of this polyhedron to here is actually homeomorphism on the boundary. So I get some new cell structure on the boundary. Okay. And then, well, this dilation takes that to some other um, cell structure. Let me, I, I guess I said it, but I didn't say. This is, this, this can be a big contraction, right? I, um, by taking this sort of bigger sphere, big enough, this is a big contraction. So all these cells get sent to tiny, tiny little cells here. So now I've got some cell structure in the sphere, and I, they're sort of made of these tiny, tiny little cells. And then now I'm going to do this closest point projection, and things get a little messy here because... You know, what's, so what's the pre-image of, of a vertex? Well, it's sort of this whole sector inside of here. And in three dimensions, it's something similar. But it's pretty easy to understand. Uh, OK? So when I map, do this final map down to here, these cells on the boundary, the images of the faces out here, they've gotten really tiny. And a bunch of them get collapsed down into the vertices. OK? Um, some of them. So basically, what doesn't happen, though, is you don't see any faces that kind of overlap two of these faces. Every face goes into one of the faces down here. Okay? Now, because some faces go into a vertex or into an edge, like you have to make some choices about you know, wh where you're going to send a reflection if it goes into a vertex or an edge. But it turns out the sort of combinatorial argument allows you to do that. And what you end up with is... Uh, so, uh, right, so you get a map, phi, um, that goes from faces of Q1 to faces of Q prime, and it has the property that um, phi of, uh, of a face contains the image um, of the face under this map. Okay, so there's a map from faces to faces. So, um, uh, right. So in particular, then, I can define a homomorphism from the reflection group here to the reflection group here by sending um, rho bar of the reflection in a face to the reflection in the image of the face. Okay, so reflections go to reflections. Those are order two to order two. So that's one of the relations in order to get a homomorphism. The other thing is that if I have adjacent faces, those are exactly commuting, they better go to adjacent faces. But that's what this condition um, tells me. So if two faces are adjacent, their images under F0 are adjacent, and they're contained in these things. So these image faces, these phi of F, those are also um, intersect. So you get a homomorphism. Um, and uh, uh, you know, if you look at the orientation covers, you can sort of build everything just like we did before. 
you get a map from this orbifold to this orbifold, gamma q uh, prime, a degree one map. So this f maps here, and so f star, this is our homomorphism rho, and uh, the volume of, of rho is just the volume of the, the m gamma q prime. Okay? So I'm out of time. Let me not write anything else, but just make some remarks. Um, this is pretty flexible. You can, you can make the optimal Lipschitz constant as close to zero as you want, or actually as close to one as you want. You have to work a little bit harder there, but it's not so hard. Um, uh, but let me also say that there are lots of constructions. So at the end of the day, we're constructing degree, you know, degree one maps, or in general, non-zero degree maps um, that are contractions. Uh, and there are lots of constructions for non-zero degree maps. So Soma, um, Ballot and Wang, uh, um, Siddharth Gett Gill has a sort of general construction, sort of equivalent formulation of when you build a degree one map. And um, so uh, trying to get examples where those are Lipschitz, though, seems to be a little tricky. However, uh, Hong Bin Sun has a construction of degree two maps, and I think now maybe degree one maps. Um, which probably can be adjusted so that those are also strict contractions. Um, okay, anyway, I'll stop there. <laughs>